the bottom uh, of the show. We're now joined by John Kirk. KC Sports Network has covered and followed the Big 12 quite a bit. Very outspoken as well during a lot of this craziness of realignment, the Big 12, and everything that went with it. John, we'll get into that a little bit later on, but let's discuss K-State. Uh, we had Gene Taylor on. Uh, he's fantastic, as uh, as many of the ADs are and seem to be in the, in the Big 12. But Chris Kleiman, to me, I just love his style. Was he actually, and it's obvious, but when he was hired, was there any like, hmm, is this the right guy or was it all pretty positive? Yeah, well, I appreciate you guys having me on. It's funny you bring that up. I had not thought about that in a long time, but there actually was. Uh, the, the fan base did not like it, uh, I'd say, for the first like 24 hours. And then there was a pretty dramatic shift after that where they did a good job of getting the messaging out. I think people sort of calmed down. Um, but it was just, simple like falling victim to the same thing that I think a lot of people have throughout the hiring process of why you don't see maybe as many FCS coaches get those sorts of opportunities or at least you didn't um, for a while it was it was just those three letters it was the FCS thing that I think really had people bothered I, I think it was that and a, a combination of that and the fact that it was Gene Taylor's guy from North Dakota State so a lot of people that would have been skeptical about Gene Taylor the job he was doing at the time which looked a little bit different just he, we had not seen the full picture and full scope of what he's done which has obviously been fantastic now but this was back in 2019 he was still much newer on the job and at that point people weren't totally sold and so you had a crowd that uh still very much was like yeah i don't know about this ad and now he's just hiring his guy this was a very easy hire could have made this hire at any point in time why go and do this and just bring your boy from the fcs school to k-state there was there was a lot of that uh right after the hire happened but it turned pretty quickly, I think, especially once he came and did a press conference. People listened to him, heard his message out, and uh, started to come around to like, okay, this seems like a guy that could really resonate with players in, in 2023 or at the time, 2019. Um, just a really good players coach, incredible culture, and uh, that became really apparent when you heard him talk. Like, all right, I kind of see what this is about. Let's let's give this a chance. And uh, he, he started to win people over pretty quickly and certainly won a lot of people over with that first season where they went eight and four in the regular season with a roster that was very, very devoid of talent. Didn't even have, they did not have a scholarship running back uh, on the roster when he took over for instance. So to go eight and four, almost nine and three in that first regular season, I think really got people on board. And uh, now obviously he's got complete and total support of everybody in a new contract uh, to do as well. So John, I remember, uh, you know, when, when Baylor won the big 12, a couple years back, a lot of people like, how do you, you know, prevent the letdown? And they said all the right things. And then there was absolutely a letdown. There's also a lack of talent in comparison to that team as well, but there was, they admitted a letdown and that's happened with, with many others that try to run it back. But when we talk to Chris Kleiman at big 12 media days, how much do you think his experience allows them to truly reset the table and not have to worry as much about, you know, carry over from last year, just assuming things are going to go a similar direction and that it really is a brand new team. Yeah, it's a really good point because I was about to go there when I started hearing the question, I was like, well, I fully understand. And I think it's a legitimate thing that K-State will have to fight this year. It's just battling a little bit of complacency because of that. I think that's just natural. Um, but if there is ever a guy that you would want as your head coach in that scenario, it's, it's the guy who had to deal with the unbelievable uh, expectations at North Dakota State every single year where it's national championship or bust and then had to defend multiple national championships and knows what that is all about. There was not much margin for error at all uh, at North Dakota State every single year that he was operating within that. So I think that will help carry the day. I think they just have such a good culture anyway. I mean, that's the thing that really stands out about the, the team and program right now all across the board. So I would imagine that that is going to really help out as well. And another thing I would throw in there is, well, they are getting a lot of national respect, uh, which honestly has, has surprised me a little bit. There is still an element I think of these guys are going to look around, for instance, on the offense and be like, hey, you know, people think Deuce Vaughn's gone, so the, the entire offense has changed. I remember seeing an anonymous quote, I think it was the Athlon preview that they did where they take anonymous quotes from big 12 coaches and, and one of them said like hey i love the culture at k-state love a lot of what's going on there but i think they're going to figure out that life is a lot more difficult when 22 isn't out there to just take all the attention of the defense even when he doesn't have the ball so i'd imagine that's probably motivating uh for a lot of those guys on the offensive side of the ball like hey we've got to prove that we can do it without dukes and uh, on the defensive side of the ball we've got to prove that we can do it without felix and julius brent a couple of top two round draft picks that were lost off of that defense so I think there's reason to believe at K-State that that would be lessened, like some of that effect would be dulled a little bit compared to where it could be in other spots, but it's very much something that they are going to have to, to battle this year. I would not even try to pretend 
that that's not going to be a storyline of the season at all. I think sometimes when people think about loud crowds and stadiums, et cetera, fan bases, football, you know, there's those that have these massive stadiums and, yeah, I mean, there's 100,000 or 90,000 or 75,000 or so, but I've been to Manhattan. Baylor played there. I was on a road trip one time, and I, I covered the game. Baylor ended up winning the game on a late pick, but my goodness, that in fact, I've been there a couple of different times. That place gets locked in. Can you try to describe game day in Manhattan when there's a big game? Yeah, well, uh, the first thing that comes to my mind is actually a quote from uh, Art Riles. I remember during his time at Baylor, and I trying to remember where exactly that was. That may have been half one too, but he had a quote where he said, "Like you, you think uh, you think it gets loud? Try try walking your happy, you know what, into Manhattan, Kansas <laughs> on game day." Uh, and uh, I'm paraphrasing there, but it was something like that. Someone needs to look that up because I'm pretty close on that. And uh, he's right. And in fact, I, I remember one of the loudest moments. I would say, like past Snyder 1.0, like the first time Bill Snyder retired, um, the loudest I think it's been since then was the 2011 game against Baylor at RG3 uh, that K State won. It was yep. a really good game back and forth, and uh, so I'm sure that that's probably what Art was referencing there in that quote. But no, I mean it, it gets very, very loud. I've been there. Now I'm still partial to again kind of the Snyder 1.0 era. Capacity was slightly smaller back then, but. I mean, it was really wild back in those days when you had great battles with Nebraska and Oklahoma and K-State was at the top of the league every single year. But it, it still does get very, very loud. I think the stadium, especially the way it's built with some of the renovations now, bigger buildings in the north end zone and then the west side of the stadium, it kind of traps the noise in uh, a little bit better. And it's, it's also just one of the best tailgating environments that you're going to find uh, across the league. The parking lot is set up great for it. Um, in fact, they just built a new indoor facility that took out some of the parking spots on the east side of the, the lot. And, boy, you wouldn't believe what kind of a big deal that was to uh, to some fans, which I, I get to an extent. But that was a lot of consternation about that because of the tailgating seats being so good. So it's awesome, and it's really what was so frustrating to me, the whole Big 12, Pac-12 thing, the truck stop conference, people yep. kind of looking down at the league. I'm like, man, come to, <laughs> come to Waco, come to Manhattan, come to Lubbock, come to Ames, you know, and see what the tailgating environment is like and how loud those stadiums get. Like, it's – it's about as good a college football environment as you're going to find. And look, I, I haven't been to the big boy stadiums in the, the SEC necessarily, but I've been to Mississippi State uh, to cover a game, and it certainly was a lot better than that. I've also been to Stanford in 2016 when they had Christian McCaffrey, and there were about 8,000 people in the tree there. So uh, I, I know how much better the Big 12 environments are than that. K-State certainly fits right in with that. It's, it's a really passionate fan base and just an awesome, awesome environment. Yeah, Spencer Hall asked Art Briles, Big 12 Stadium, most intense atmosphere. And he said, right when you said it, I thought Manhattan, Kansas, you want to stand next to someone and not be able to hear them walk your ass into Manhattan, Kansas. <laughs> that was the exact quote. There we go. I feel like I was close. You know, I got yeah, you were of the way there. Yeah. Uh, so, as somebody who covers a team, you obviously have a different perspective than those who you know follow closely but aren't necessarily boots on the ground day to day. That's just the case with with anybody who's that close to it, like we would be with you know the, the Bears, for example. What is the biggest question you have about K State entering this season? Yeah, I frame it up like this. I think the uh, the, the depth of the program is in a place that it hasn't been since probably I suppose like the 2012 team. I think just in terms of the way they've been recruiting here over the last three or four years, Kleiman has slowly raised that profile. It's not like you're going to go look at the recruiting rankings and be like, oh, man, they've been putting together top ten classes. It's not anything like that. But, I mean, by the end of Bill Snyder's second run, and this is not meant to really run him down, it's just the reality of the situation, they were recruiting classes full of guys that not only were just like two and three stars but did not really have many other Power Five offers. And now they're they're beating out lots of Power Five competition. They've landed guys like – uh, Avery Johnson, who's going to be next in line at quarterback, who was a real national recruit there. And they've had a handful of guys who have been borderline like national recruits that they've been able to pull in, which is just a, a huge uh, step in the right direction for a program that's always been about developing guys. And Climate has already proven he can win uh, eight games in a season with just a totally developmental roster. It's in a much better place across the board there. But my, my question is going to be, can you replace the star power? Because, well, the depth of talent is there, you are missing Deuce Vaughn. You are missing Felix Andy DK Uzama, first round pick. You're missing Julius Brent, second round pick. Josh Hayes was a sixth round pick. He's gone in the secondary. Echo Boydo, gone in the secondary. He may make the Chiefs 53 man roster after just being a, a camp invitee. He's having a really nice camp and preseason for the Chiefs so far. 
So there's a lot to replace there. And, and those guys were studs that have been around for a long time. So I think the question becomes, all right, Treshawn Ward, really nice running back transfer from Florida State, Big 12 Offensive Newcomer of the Year. But him combined with D.J. Giddens, are those two going to be enough to it at least give you, you know, 75 80% of what Deuce Vaughn was giving you? I, I think Ward has a lot of potential. I think Giddens has a lot of potential. Looked great against Alabama uh, in the Sugar Bowl, albeit kind of in, in garbage time in that game. But it, it, giving K-State fans a lot of optimism there. On the defensive side of the ball, like Khalid Duke, at one point he was the, the guy that everybody expected to have a meteoric rise to be the – NFL draftee as a, as a pass rusher, and it turned into Felix and Udike Uzama kind of stepping in front of him developmental-wise, and some injuries have held Khalid Duke back, but he's now back to just rushing the passer. They tried him at linebacker a little bit, too. I think that stunted some of his growth. Can he step in and be the guy that everybody thought a couple of years ago was going to be the one that turns into an, an NFL draft pick? They have Will Lee at corner, who was one of the best Juco defensive backs out there that Alabama made a serious run out late. They were able to hold off the Crimson Tide and keep him in there, but you know, is he going to be Julius Brents right away? We'll see. Uh, that, to me, is the question. If they're going to make it back to Arlington, I think they need some of those guys to really pop and become stars. And uh, that is my question. I guess the other thing that could happen is Will Howard last year was excellent. When he played quarterback, K-State had the fifth most efficient offense in the country on the drive that he was out there in terms of points per drive. If he can still elevate his game without Deuce and make everybody around them better, if Keegan Johnson, a transfer that they love from Iowa receiver, can be more consistent than Malik Knowles at wideout. Maybe they have a star receiver all of a sudden. Ben Sinnott, I think, has star potential at tight end and, and was great at the end of last year. If some of those guys, if they get a couple of them to really hit and become stars like what they had last year, I think they'll have definitely a chance to get back to Arlington. But to me, that is that is a pretty big question mark. What's it like seeing Deuce Vaughn run around? I know it's preseason, but you know you can tell how he's going to translate I'd imagine not really many surprises on the K State fans end of thing. You, you know, you and, and many others, and we too. I mean, seeing him, we we believe in, in Deuce Vaughn, but it's just kind of amazing to see others. You know, who is this guy running around here? Who's this guy for the Cowboys? What have been your thoughts on seeing him in action? Well, one of my favorite pastimes has turned into uh, taking the either the NFL account or the Cowboys account and just looking at the quote tweets and seeing all the people in there. Like, all right, I was wrong. This dude can play. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's, that's been one of my favorite things to do to watch it because I was, I mean, I was sure. Like, I, I compared it to when Tyler Lockett came out. I remember we had a, a Seattle beat writer, like kind of your old hardened beat guy that covered the Seahawks and had for a long time on, on my radio show back then. And I remember asking him, like, we were just talking about Tyler and what his role was going to be. And I, I just vividly remember him being like, yeah, you know, special teams are going to want him to use, you know, special teams. Maybe he'll catch a couple balls. We'll see. And I was a little put off by the attitude there. I was like, I don't think you understand. Like, this dude can really play. Like, this, this guy torched everybody in the Big 12. But it was this thought, like, hey, he's a little bit small. I don't know if he'll be able to really hack it. And they were looking at it more as, like, a special team sort of weapon. Same feeling that I had here with Deuce. I was like, I, you guys don't understand, man. This cat can play. And, uh, you know, he wasn't running 70 yards for a touchdown against Alabama for no reason. Like, he's he's legit. So, it's it's been a thrill. I just can't say enough good things about not only those player he is but just the person he is like his family um he's just an unbelievable teammate unbelievable leader incredibly engaging to talk to just like in an interview setting i i you could not create like a more perfect player i think than than what deuce vaughn is outside of the height but i don't think that's really going to matter i've I've got a lot of confidence that he's going to carve out a nice role in the nfl all right so john let's get straight to the i have to know and people in the chat room want us to know want to know were you Endeavor? Were you 12 Annan? Were you Karen? 12 Annan. 12 and I always say Annan. Uh, were you Karen? <laughs> I know that could... God, can you believe all the crap that was out there for so long? Well, I, I have to tell everybody, I, I tweeted this the other day, but I, I just actually uh, got the keys to my new house from uh, from Karen. She, oh, nice. She hooked me up with a nice, nice mansion out here in Leewood, the suburbs of uh, Kansas City. I, I, I kid, only... Only maybe just a little bit. We can let the, the Pac-12 reporters do some digging on that. They can find out the real answers, I suppose. But, man, I, I, I mean, it was wild. It was wild, and it, it, it's just so funny to see the aftermath of it. There have been so many, like, hey, rest in peace, Pac-12. Here's kind of the postmortem article about what happened, how we got here. And every single one of those articles, I'm just, like, going down, like, a bullet point checklist of, like, hey, here's something Big 12 Twitter said. Here's something Big yep. 12 Twitter said. Here's something Dennis Dodd said. Here's something. And it's like now being reported from the Pac-12 side as they all kind of rush to, to blame everybody. So 
Yeah, I mean, look, I, I, I try to say at the same time and stress this, I, I'm not a fan of where the game is going in general. I don't like the fact that we're blowing up a conference that's been around for as long as the Pac-12 has and taking major college football away from the West Coast. I, I'm not a fan of that in general, but look, this league has been trampled on for like two decades now with all the jokes and always getting teams picked from it as opposed to being in a position of power. And so like, forgive me if I do take a, a little bit of time to gloat about one being right and two just actually being here in a position where you're not the weak link in conference realignment. So it's a, it's a tough dichotomy. It's made it a little bit frustrating to see, especially all the outpouring of stuff for like Stanford and Cal. Like if you want to be, I am very sad for Oregon State and Washington State, and I feel terrible for them, but it seems like most of the attention has been like this Notre Dame attitude of like, oh, well, how could we, how could we possibly do this to Stanford and Cal? Like Stanford and Cal were a huge part of the problem, and Stanford has $37.8 billion in their endowment. Like, I think they'll figure it out. They'll be okay. I feel bad for Oregon State and Washington State, but um, the rest of it, you can kind of miss me with, uh, with that reaction. How do you feel? Just, I mean, I know you don't want to, well, Utah sucks. We didn't really want them any, but no, I mean, I'm like you. I mean, I I don't think the big 12 can really, I mean, they can afford to breathe for a second, but I think anybody in college athletics has to still be very much on their toes. But I mean, how do you feel versus maybe what your original expectations were of how it was going to shake out knowing what it's going to look like heading into next year? Yeah, I'll be honest. And I I said this as much when it was happening, I always kind of felt like, 30 70 that the big 12 would wind up in a position like this and maybe even then it was i'd have to go back and play the tape on what i said and what i was thinking at the time but i was even thinking like hey landing colorado and arizona would be great yeah and it felt like utah and arizona's state's reaction was so strongly against strongly opposed going to the big 12 it it always felt like pipe dream is probably a a bit too strong but it just felt a little far-fetched for me that that was going to happen and so I was honestly surprised that it worked out the way that it did, which I, I really shouldn't be with Brett Yormark and the way that, that he works because that guy is, is incredible. And he's, he's been able to make all the right moves, do all the right things, and kind of play 40 chess while, while everybody else, at least George Klievkov, was playing checkers. Um, so I probably was a little bit off even in that. But I was trying to be conservative with it. And really it was just a point of like, hey, I, the, the Pac-12 is leaving itself very vulnerable. Here. That was the point I was always trying to stress. And like, hey – it seems very clear that George Klievkov has made a bevy of missteps. Now, I think with some of the reporting in hindsight, it looks like a lot of that may have been directed by the presidents, and you really could direct a lot of the blame up at the presidents who are like listening to random professors on campus tell them that they're worth $50 million a year and things like that. Um, but it just, th- that stuff was so obvious. And, you know, it kind of sometimes you have to check yourself like, am I crazy? I feel like I'm just reading the tea leaves here and looking at the facts presented in front of me, and it seems like this could be a problem for them. But I still felt like getting it across the finish line would be uh, a little bit out of reach for the league. So pleasantly surprised. And uh, honestly, I mean, watching U- Utah, I know, was like a – they were kind of the subject of my ire for a little while there with, with some of the fans on social media. But looking at their leadership, like the press conference they had, I thought was great. Um, it's easy to see why that football program has been so successful. I think the leadership across the board there is just excellent. And I think most of the fans seem to have come around. So I'm, I'm welcoming Utah with open arms. Arizona State fans, I think, are fine because they realize that their leadership is a problem. But, boy, uh, that leadership when it comes to athletics seems to be a bit of an issue right now, university president and uh, and athletic director. So we'll we'll see uh, what's going to happen with that. But nothing, no qualms with uh, Arizona State fans. So I'm hoping for you know, a little, little period of kumbaya here for everybody. Thank you, John. Great stuff. I'm glad we have you on. Appreciate your insight. Bunch of great stuff on K-State football, names, players, and Chris Kleiman, and also much more. John Kurtz from the KC Sports Network.